The Week in Art is sponsored by Christie's. Visit christies.com to find out more about the world's leading auction house since 1766. Auction, private sales, online, art, anytime. Hello and welcome to The Week in Art. I'm Ben Luke. It's the final episode of 2020 and so, as we always do as the year comes to an end, we're reviewing the last 12 months in the art world. And what a year it's been. Before we begin our review of the year, a reminder that you can sign up to the Art Newspaper's free daily newsletter for all the latest stories. Go to theartnewspaper.com and the newsletter link is at the top right of the page. And while you're there, you can also sign up for a range of other newsletters, including the monthly Art Market Eye. Now, to look at the year's biggest stories, I was joined by three of the Art Newspaper's correspondents on the front line reporting the huge events of this year and their effects on the art world. Anna Brady is our Art Market Editor, Louisa Buck is our Contemporary Art Correspondent, and Gareth Harris is our Chief Contributing Editor. Inevitably, as we tackled the year's events, two major global stories dominated the discussions, the coronavirus pandemic and the death of George Floyd and the fight for racial justice. I'd like to begin by talking about the effect of COVID on the market. And Anna, obviously, this is your area of expertise. And I want to begin by talking about the fairs, because in a way, they've been the marker of this exponential rise in the market over the last decade. But they fell just as suddenly this year, didn't they? Tell me about fairs under COVID. So back in March, um, the sort of early middle March, um, Tefaf Maastricht happened and it was kind of had it happened a week beforehand it might have been okay and had it happened a week afterwards I think it definitely would have been cancelled um, and myself and a lot of other journalists went out to go and see the fair and it had a very strange kind of atmosphere people were sort of jokingly foot tapping and elbow bumping but I think people sort of thought that something like a virus that's affecting the out- outside world won't penetrate those walls and you know the sort of champagne and canapes of that but a week later it was shut down an exhibitor had got tested positive for covid and after that so many people it turned out who caught the virus at the fair and some of them were really really ill and in intensive care and i think that was just a for me that was the kind of big wake-up call obviously then the uk went into lockdown um the us after that and the armory week happened at the same sort of time but it was it definitely was a kind of big reality shock um, that this was going to be something that really was going to affect all of us. It didn't matter how wealthy you were or whether you were in an art fair. Um, this virus didn't have any kind of respect for those sorts of those sorts of boundaries. And it's just, as one dealer said to me, everything kind of fell off a cliff in late March, really. And then you just saw this sort of chain of cancellations of all the big fairs. I mean, it's fair to say that the big, the big fairs have had a terrible year, right, Anna? Yeah, they've had an awful year. At the end of January, I was thinking back to when we spoke right at the beginning of the year, doing a year ahead podcast. And I remember when I was leaving afterwards, um, sending, I think, you and Maggie a message saying, um, damn it, we didn't mention coronavirus. And that was such a big mistake. Because at that point, we were recording that sort of start of January, and we thought of it very much still as an Asian problem. And a lot of the talk then was about whether Art Basel in Hong Kong was going to be cancelled, and it was at the end of January. But I think people still thought that it was going to be quite contained um, over there. But after that, you know, it used to be that fairs being cancelled was news. Now, fairs going ahead is news. Uh, just There just hasn't really been anything since um, about March, aside from those fairs in, in Shanghai, in November, which did manage to go ahead. That is a different world to the rest of the world at the moment. And I don't think we're really going to see any until about late May next year, by the looks of it, aside from, say, Art Dubai, which is saying that it will go ahead in March. But um, whether it actually will or not, um, it's very much a matter of debate. Gareth, that's right, isn't it? All the fairs are sort of basically postponing, and then there's going to be this glut of fairs that happened in the middle of 2021 right yeah totally i mean i think the art world is beginning to think about a return to some kind of post-virus normality but that's difficult as anna just said because the 2021 calendar is looking quite crunchy really i think art basel hong kong is the first anna scheduled to kick off next may and yeah. Freeze new york is next summer 
So I think there's about six or seven major fairs in a row. So within how... a few weeks, within like May to that, we've got TAFE of Maastricht delayed. Um, yeah. Hong Kong, Art Basel in Hong Kong, Freeze New York, and then Art Basel as well, and then Freeze LA in July. Um, but we've so been here before. Back. Yeah, I mean, but we thought that September was going to be back to back this year with fairs that were delayed from um, the spring and sort of early summer, and they weren't. They never actually happened. So. I sort of, we could be faced with a crunch or we could be faced with nothing at all as we were in September. It's really hard to know. But that's difficult, isn't it? Because dealers and collectors have to prioritise then where they're going to go next spring or summer, depending on all sorts of things like a vaccine and, and, and all other sorts of corona sort of things. I mean, I just wonder how dealers will decide where to go. I mean, I spoke to Dominique Levy a few weeks ago and she said she's going to have to prioritise and that would be quite difficult to do. But I suppose collectors are just itching, and well, and curators and dealers, they're just itching to get back to in real life, aren't they? <laughs> That's but the isn't point. that, I mean, isn't that, isn't that a bit naive? I mean, Louisa, I don't know what you think. It seems to me that there's this sort of obsession with returning to normality. And how can we return to normality after all of this? Well, I was, I was also going to say, I mean, how also, there's only a finite pool of collectors, even in these different art hubs, you know. And if all these fairs are back to back, you know, I think the collectors are going to be prioritising and that's problematic too because where are they going to go? Which fairs are they going to choose? And I do agree, this new normal seems like just rushing back to the old normal, you know, flying all over the place, having the fairs again. I mean, the fairs are changing, aren't they, Anna? I mean, Freeze, Freeze LA is going to be in series of, of, of private houses and venues. It's not going to be in Paramount Studios anymore. It's going to be much smaller. Freeze New York is going to be smaller as well, much more in and, and, and a different location. So they are actually actually scaling down but I still think this kind of crunching and all rushing together is is very problematic. Um, Anna is there any sort of data that you have on what happens when you do get clusters of fairs in that sense is it is 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 it ill-advised for fairs to cluster in that way or are there just that many collectors in the different regions that ultimately they're all successful events? It's hard to talk about data when it comes to fairs because it's always been sort of impossible to accumulate we've spoken about this before but to to actually record sales data when it comes to fairs because you cannot insist that galleries report all their sales or indeed what price they actually sold works for, which of course is a big conversation generally. So it's always been very, very hard to compare and contrast um, the financial successes of different fairs. So I don't think you can talk about that. Historically, there has been certain moments within different cities around the world when everyone flies into that city and then you have this kind of confluence of um, fairs, exhibitions and auctions. That is one of the main things that has been completely done away with this year because the calendar has been blown apart. So you don't have everybody coming to, say, London in October for Freeze Week and the auctions and the exhibitions. So, um, so that's going to be the weird thing about this May, June, July thing, if it does happen, because it's across the world. It's from Hong Kong to L.A. And so I don't get how... I mean, if you're going to attend all of those fairs or if you're expecting your big collectors to attend all those fairs, you're kind of expecting them to be on a plane from sort of mid-May to mid-July. And that doesn't doesn't really work as far as I'm concerned. So I think people are going to... I think there is going to be a consolidation of fairs. Um, I think this year... People saying they're going to have these fairs then, it's mm. kind of a show of confidence that everybody wants to get back to it. So a lot of this is all the kind of talk of we're going to go ahead, we're going to find a way of doing it. Because to say that you're going to cancel or to not do something is is in some ways a form of sort of defeat. It's not commercially sensible to do that. So they're all going to try and go ahead in some form. Which ones work and which ones won't? I, we're just going to have to wait, wait and see. And it will depend on the um, situation with the virus and those different places when we get to early summer next year so it's very hard to tell from any there's no historical precedent for it so it's very hard to tell how this might actually actually work and practically it's going to be a bit of a nightmare there will still be a much greater presence online i mean the big the big shift of course has been by necessity that everything has gone online i mean the word viewing room i kind of love because actually it's just a sort of load of pdfs on a website really but <laughs> <laughs> but there has been this sense of you know making more content for the galleries um studio tours the whole use of, of virtual reality and enhanced reality being able to tour around of course everybody knows it's not the same thing as a physical encounter with an artwork but it's 
also given a great deal of transparency, hasn't it, Anna, as well in the, in the market? Because they've actually, galleries have actually had to put the prices on on the viewing rooms, on the names of, on the, beside the work. I don't know it's made it any more transparent, though. No. I think it's gone yeah. right away. The price brackets way. are huge. The price brackets <laughs> yeah. have been huge, haven't they? Yeah. I think, and I think also, although you might get the odd price on an online viewing room, I think the whole market generally has become a lot, a lot more closed, even more so than it was in clandestine. And you can look at on the flip side of that, you've got the huge rise in private sales at auction houses as well. So I don't know that a few prices online viewing rooms when you don't really, I don't know, I don't really believe the sales reports that come out of online viewing rooms either. But maybe I'm just being too cynical. <laughs> don't you get the sense as well, Anna, that collectors are so tired of the, of the online viewing so rooms? So boring. Yeah. Well, it's not a great way to encounter artworks, is it? I mean, and I think it's it has been really problematic. But on the other hand, I feel that when things do get back, to what, whatever they get back to, that whole online aspect of galleries putting content on their websites, of putting, you know, greater a greater exposure to artists, artist talks, all that will, I think, remain as a residue more than it had had done in previously, and that's no bad thing, I think. All three of you are in touch with dealers and galleries all the time you're going to these spaces when when they're open when we're not in lockdown what's the sense you're getting from the people you're talking to on the ground about how optimistic or not they are about their current position gareth you've been going around galleries talking to dealers how are they feeling about everything you mean in terms of their general business dealings yes yeah i think they're still fairly uncertain i mean a lot of them are talking about getting back to the in real life fears as i said um, again, like the collectors, what comes across is they are, they have tired of the online viewing room experience, as sophisticated as they are now. I think they don't think that's really an adequate enough platform now. But they're generally optimistic, I think, about the, the calendar restarting next spring. I mean, whether that will happen, I don't know. I mean, perhaps Anna can say, you know, will Americans really fly over for Basel next June? Even in seven months' time, I'm not sure that will happen, to be honest. I agree. I mean, it took a long time after, say, 9-11 for American buyers to start wanting to fly over to Europe and, and to the UK. Art collectors are generally in an older age bracket as well, and wealthy elderly people are generally quite nervous about getting sick. It's one thing you can't guide, you know, guard against, and money can't guard you against that. Um, and I think they don't really have that much reason to come to Europe. If I was a rich American collector of a certain age, I don't know that I, you know, the art can come to you, frankly. I don't know that you would need to come over. But does that mean you continue to mine local audiences? I thought it was interesting what we were saying about Freeze LA. It's going to those different venues. And I know Art Basel Miami Beach didn't happen this year physically, but there was a real concerted effort to draw the Americans down to Miami and Palm Beach with pop-ups in the design district, that kind of thing. So I'm wondering even if next summer, will fears depend just as much on their local client bases, if you see what I mean in that sense? Perhaps we won't see those international audiences flocking back. It's interesting, isn't it? I mean, Louisa, we've been talking a lot this year about, you know, there's been endless zoom art world discussions about local being the new global <laughs> i mean you know there's probably there's probably a good 50 talks of that nature that have happened i mean um it, it's all very well saying that isn't it but the 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 art world ecosystem has relied upon globalism as it's a fundamental part of its its growth so do you sense that um dealers are tapping into local communities more and that you know relying upon local collector bases and all that side of thing or do you think that's sort of lip service just or almost a sense of panic about yes we're going to get more local now <laughs> i think certainly if there's a if there's a move towards local that will then make these clusters of art fairs more doable because it will be tapping into a grassroots audience as well as relying on the international clientele but i do think that galleries you know it is it is a global market whatever and the and the big spenders are t- to be across a global reach so I think there's a probably a kind of two tier thing of, of, of actually yes fostering your local local roots and doing and doing art fairs that are more locally based but also still trying to make um, 
alliances across galleries. I mean, one thing that's really struck me about the art, the commercial art world, is that, I mean, it's notoriously competitive. I think you're right, Anna. Yes, you know, it's still opaque. Different price points vary according to who you ask. But it has been a more collegial sense across the art world. I think, you know, when lockdown first happened, there was a WhatsApp group amongst, you know, London art galleries, all sharing information about furloughs and about what to do about the various kind of, you know, COVID practices. Then you had the gallery platform with David Zwerner, who um, invited younger galleries to be able to come and into their into their sites. Now you could argue that's a kind of rather canny move to freshen up your <laughs> freshen up your stable. But you know, then you also had um, you know the LA rotating rooms as well, the platform gallery platform in Los Angeles. So you had this sense of galleries in in certain areas actually collaborating and working together. And now there's a, a new. I just just yesterday I got information. You probably know about this too, Anna, about this new galleries curate R H E. Ray, which is which is an international consortium of galleries, Sadie Coles, Macaroni, all sorts across the world, doing curated shows in each other's spaces. So there is a sense of joining forces and trying to kind of you know work together more. I think, which is which is very interesting. Let's talk about auctions now. The auction houses, Anna. I mean, last week on the um, podcast we had Ivan McQuiston who was talking, I think, about small auction houses actually doing all right out of. COVID. They have had to move online, but they've done all right out of it. But has it affected the big auction houses? So the big auction houses, I mean, auction as a format probably um, translates best online. And they had a bit of a kind of running start with this anyway, because we've been used to online sales and online bidding for the past sort of decade or so. So um, they were in a better position to translate in, into that kind of environment. And you've got the immediacy, which is what works with e-commerce as well. You can actually bid there and then and buy, um, which is not what happens in OVR. So the, the auctions have really, Christie's and Sotheby's and Phillips, they've all gone in for online sales. Um, Sotheby's this year has had over 400 online auctions. I mean, it's been kind of exhausting. There's been so many of them, it's ridiculous. Um, and they, uh, Sotheby's are coming out with their year-end results um, today, but later on, so we can't talk about total figures yet, but they have achieved about $570 million in their online Um, sales this year which is seven times the volume of the whole of last year so they've done quite well on on that front Christie's too have massively increased their online sales um Guillaume Ceruti the chief executive of Christie's said in a call earlier this week that um their total sales figures for this year are going to be somewhere between 3.4 and 3.5 billion pounds that is and uh, that will be about 25% down on last year. So we're probably going to see something quite similar from Sotheby's. It's going to be down on last year. Uh, what's unusual about this year is it's going to be a, a big sort of backlog of activity towards the second half of the year. You wouldn't normally expect to see that. But because we had this sort of year-round trading, there was no big summer break, as you'd normally expect to see, with sales being postponed from um, the sort of immediate aftermath of, of the virus outbreak. Um a lot of the value of this year has been in the second half as well, which is sort of quite unusual. They've they've been very, very quick to kind of adapt. Um, Gim Suruti referred to it as being a shock and a catalyst, and I think that's, that's true. But um, bear in mind, larger auction houses as well, they're very well equipped to cope with this sort of thing. They have large digital teams, large marketing teams. They've also been creating sales out of a, a lot of the stock or collections as they like to refer to them of um, dealers they might be antiques dealers might be more modern art dealers largely antiques and say old master dealers so they've been creating a lot of sales from these dealers who don't have any fairs to go to as well so they've kind of been able to kind of get the sort out some of the supply side at least in the middle market from that um, so they've been very quick at, at jumping onto this but they've kind of been able to but then they also have cut a lot of staff because they need to cut their costs but also producing online sales you don't need anywhere near the amount of people to run one of these big um, headquarters and have you know in real life sales as well so we have unfortunately seen huge um, staff cuts and, and restructuring as well within the auction houses so it's not you know they haven't been plain sailing through this period at all. But does that mean auctions are more democratic then? Have there been lots of new buyers? Because I thought Georgina Adams' piece today in the Art Market Eye was fascinating about younger Asian collectors, how the Asian sales have been quite strong at Phillips. 
And she mentioned the people in the 30s and 40s who work in the tech industry coming in via luxury goods. I thought that was really interesting. I think people do see auctions as being the most public and democratic and maybe the most transparent way of, of buying art as well. Um, bear in mind as well that you know Christie's and Sotheby's have huge brands as well. They have a sort of, and say in Asia, their brands are very, very strong too. So they... Um, they can kind of capitalise on the fact that people recognise and they see them as being trustworthy too. And maybe a brand on a level that they might see a luxury brand or a fashion brand too. So they're, they're quite kind of happy buying buying from them. And, and yes, it's seen as, a public auction is seen as being democratic. It's seen as being a, a good a way of getting a fair price for a work of art, whether or not that's right, because we know that there are a lot of financial machinations such as guarantees that will also dictate prices at auction at the top end. Um, but it's also something that you see playing out with all the deaccessioning of works as well in the, you know, yes, it's seen as the most transparent way for new buyers to come into the market and start buying art, but it's also seen as the most transparent way of selling off works for a fair price when it might be quite a kind of contentious decision to do so. Um, deaccessioning, wow. Hot topic. We're yeah. going to call, we're going to come on to deaccessioning. <laughs> I, I wanted to talk first, though, about artists because when we talk about the market, I'm really conscious we're talking about stratospheric figures. We're talking about money sloshing around everywhere. We're talking about galleries and swish dealers and everything else. But one of the key factors this year has been the precariousness of artists. And Louisa, I mean, this has really been brought into sharp relief in 2020, hasn't it? That, that, that artists' livelihoods are really under threat. Artists in general are are really struggling. Absolutely, yes. I mean, I think, you know, many artists, you know, might not make money specifically from selling their work. They might make money as art, freelance art workers within the sector, within working as technicians, as teaching, within all these different kinds of aspects. And that, that whole side of things has absolutely, you know, been slashed to the ribbons. There have been Arts Council emergency funds and various funds to help artists out. But, you know, a lot of people have fallen between the cracks there and it's been a very, very difficult, very difficult kind of, you know, set situation. I mean, the Arts Council immediately did their emergency response fund giving grants of up to two and a half thousand pounds just to bail people out so they could pay their bills but you know now they've actually upped their develop your creative practice the next tranche of grants for that has gone up from four million to 18 million pounds but this is for artists to kind of keep their practice going so yes it's been very very precarious and very very problematic for artists but i do think there have been lifelines um the most well, one of the most successful initiatives has been the Artist Support Pledge, initiated by artist Matthew Burroughs in March. And it's quite a simple concept, really. I, I have to always make sure I get it right. But artists are invited to post images of their works for sale for £200 or less on Instagram. They use the hashtag Artist Support Pledge. Every time an artist makes £1,000 in sales, they then in turn pledge to spend £200 on work by another participating artist, which it's not, you know, perhaps I've made it sound a little more complicated than it is. But I mean, Matthew Burroughs has really helped artists. They have more liquidity. It's driven more traffic to artists' websites. So I think as a platform, that's been really successful. And I, I do think it's interesting how that has changed the model of trading to a, to a degree. I did ask him when I interviewed him a few months ago about the £200 threshold and whether he thought that was competition for galleries. And he said it was too low, you know, there's no profit margin in there, so it's not a threat. But I, I mean, Louisa knows how many artists have sold through that platform now, and I think that's fascinating, the volume. What was interesting is, is that, you know, actually successful artists who are represented by galleries wanted to be involved because it was part of a democratic inter-artist activity where artists were actually putting back. And, and as, you, as, as you say, once you'd made £1,000, you then recommitted, um, you, you pledged to spend £200 back into that economy. So it was a whole circular economy that now generated £70 million in sales and it's just constantly on, on the rise. And it's an artist initiative 
initiative. And I think what's been interesting is, yes, it's been a very precarious time for artists, but artists are, and this is what they do, they're creative. And there's been, there's artist support pledge. There was also artists, you know, going online, doing studio visits, being much more kind of entrepreneurial and, and I mean, connecting with artist support pledge. There was also an online art school where artists actually helped producing classes for people who are doing homeschooling and actually just wanted to kind of democratise the whole art school system. So there was this very much this sort of entrepreneurial DIY situation. Now, this doesn't in any way count out the fact that artists have been having an extremely difficult time of it. But there was a sense of, of people, you know, using the internet, using Instagram. Um, Bob and Roberta Smith were doing art tasks every day that you did. Um, there were all these different kinds of initiatives that I think, you know, really showed that artists actually got with it and, and artist support pledge being one of the most conspicuous examples. Yeah. And th- th- some institutions have also stepped up in terms of helping artists, haven't they? I mean, we on our website at theartnewspaper.com, we've had this kind of rolling uh, resource where people could check in and see what what resources were available to them. But also things like you know, the Tate making a very sensible decision not to have the Turner Prize in any recognisable form, but instead to award 10 artists, you know, to spread the award, the usual award across 10 artists. Things like that show a solidarity between institutions and artists. After all, artists are the lifeblood of institutions, Louisa. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, the Contemporary Art Society also had an emergency fund and, you know, artists designed face masks, actually was, was crowdfunding that, that then enabled artists' commissions and works to be acquired from artists for institutions. So there was very much this kind of cross-market sense of of, of of helping you know institutions helping helping out but of course the institutions also have been you know heavily under the cosh themselves and i mean you know the whole notion of, of trying to kind of keep trying to furlough and trying to keep people employed and the way in which there have been huge crises because institutions have been encouraged to run themselves as commercial enterprises and have these commercial arms when your restaurants are closed your cafes are closed your shops are closed it was very problematic i mean tate had to lose half its commercial workforce and had to you know, make massive cuts. And as a charity, they weren't able to use their government bailout fund to help that commercial arm. I know the South Bank Centre, too, has made 50% of their workforce redundant. And a lot of these people are actually artists as well who work in these in these institutions. So it's it's very problematic, I think, you know, trying to kind of keep these economies going. Yeah, there are chinks of light, though, Ben. This week, I mean, I reported that the South Bank Centre will be rehiring 40 workers through the coronavirus job retention scheme. The South Bank Centre obviously went back and, and thought, you know, they've reconsidered, they've rethought about restructuring and they're taking 40 workers back. Um, and they're rehiring them. So I thought that was a fairly positive development in the gloom. But generally, as you say, those museum those museum workforces and staffing levels have just been slashed and and it's hard to know what will happen next year after March when the Emergency Cultural Recovery Fund runs out because that's, I think, the real crisis point when that funding goes. What will happen... Exactly. There's a lot of hopes being pinned on that vaccine, aren't there? I mean, I, I, And I wanted to talk about this more generally in the context of different parts of the world and the way that they fund their museums because what we've seen this year very clearly is that some of the European countries and uh, their museums are much more state funded and therefore have a much have a more solid platform from which to build once coronavirus is over but as Louisa pointed out the UK museums rather like the US museums are deeply reliant upon private funding and in the UK particularly it's catering it's shop sales all that kind of stuff rather like the US it's less reliant upon big donors and trustees giving loads of money. But still, in the US and UK, it's really brought into sharp relief how precarious they are in terms of their funding in comparison to Europe. Louisa, do you want to say something about that? We've had a shift in the UK towards an increased reliance on private funding, on corporate funding, rather than state funding. Um, Now, an American-style model, but of course we don't have the history of philanthropy that American institutions have. So you're kind of between a rock and a hard place, you know, falling between two stools. Also, I really want to flag up a huge issue, which we haven't mentioned yet, which is the environmental issue. You know, we have COVID, we have, you know, pandemics, but, you know, bottom line is there is a huge environmental mental crisis taking place at the moment and I think institutions certainly in the UK have been very 
astute about this. They've been very on the ball about it, um, partly because Arts Council funding doesn't actually get given to their regular portfolio organisations unless they've actually done a carbon audit and shown they're going to make you know, changes to the environmental situation. So, of course, now, you, with this reliance on private funding, there's been a big backlash already against BP and other you know, dodgy, if you like, from the dodgy environmental record funders. So I think now we're going to go back to looking at what funders are going to be available to support museums and galleries and it's going to be very difficult because there's much more scrutiny now about the kind of private sponsorship there is and I just want to make a point also that you know the, the, the public art sector has been very much ahead of the game with um, with environmental measures um, Tate are very conscientious they declare climate emergency there's been a, a big a big session and also now within the commercial sector I talked earlier about a kind of more collegiate sector between commercial galleries and actually I've, I've you know full disclaimer I've been part of, of, of helping to organize it a, an organization called gallery climate coalition in the UK which you know has been has brought together um, you know, a, a large amount of galleries to to actually you know we've, we've now got we've now got over 60 galleries in the UK and internationally joining up as well to actually try and commit to reducing their carbon footprint by 50% over the next 10 years in in, a, in alliance with with, a, with the Paris agreement and to have zero waste so we've got all these different sectors now you know thinking very hard about how to be conscientious environmentally um, a couple of galleries I know have actually said they're not going to do international art fairs unless they can get there by train um, which of course is, is, is also putting financial pressure in some respects, but also actually a lot of these measures are rather more economic as well to do if you're, if you're thinking about your carbon footprint. So it's interesting that both the commercial and the public sector are now you know, thinking about the environment. And I think with the reliance on private funding, there's going to be much more kind of scrutiny about the kind of funders that there are to, to support these institutions. Is there a danger, though, Gareth? I mean, you know, um, one of the things that we've seen in the UK, and I know it's happening overseas too in the US and elsewhere, is that, there, you know, this extra pressure on funding now, it means reduced programmes, it means all sorts of other things. But one of the key things is, you know, a, a encouraging museums to be even more reliant on private funding you know you know the the UK arts minister culture minister Oliver Dowden has said that they need to get more commercial if anything and if that's the case how can we have ethical funding structures which which are being demanded across the board in the US the UK and in and in Europe when suddenly our museums and other institutions are so desperate for funds that they really need to be thinking even more creatively about where they get them from that's difficult, isn't it? I mean, there was a bit of a fuss recently when the National Gallery decided to charge for a a video tour of Artemisia. Uh, the curator leads it. You can access it on YouTube. You have to pay £8. And, uh, <laughs> I mean, I thought that was reasonable, personally, in terms of trying to monetise, you know, your collection and that kind of thing. But there was a bit you're of so, a backlash. You're so generous, Gary. <laughs> <laughs> there was a backlash, and I did think perhaps eight pounds is rather steep, in, you know, on reflection. But well, it was everyone a good else was doing it for free. It's I, mean, true. I think that's it's the true. thing. <laughs> no, I agree with you. When you look online and the YouTube offerings for museums, it's fantastic. But you know, I think they were probably responding to Oliver Dowden's call to to monetize their digital offerings, that kind of thing. But I think that backfired actually in quite a big way. I mean, it's still up. You can still get to see the tour for eight pounds if you want to pay that but i do think it's interesting what you're saying about a realignment of priorities funding priorities post covid and i we were talking about ethical funding and it takes me back to february when i went to the british museum and there was a huge protest by the bp or not bp group i think there were 1500 protests it was the largest they said it was the largest takeover of the museum so I am curious about what happens in the new world. You know, do we go back to those issues which were right at the forefront of museum strategy, wasn't there? You know, should they take on funders like BP, that kind of thing? I mean, you wrote a, a comment piece, Ben, at the time in February about the, the protest at the BM. And you said sponsorship makes museum directors mouthpieces for their funders. And you argued that certain directors, Mr Fisher, were dangerously out of touch with their younger audiences. And, I mean, it's, t it's gone on the back burner a little, I suppose, because, you know, the funding has, obviously, the structure's completely changed with things like the slump in international tourism, lack of visitors generally, revenue models have been shattered. But what happens next year post 
vaccine is going to be fascinating. Will that ethical funding issue come to the forefront again? I think it's going to have to because who replaces the lost earnings, lost income streams? Will it be those unethical, I say in quotation mark, funders? I'm not sure. Anna, were there similar debates in the market about ethics? You know, museums have been dominated by ethics this year and over the recent years. We've heard about the Gallery Climate Coalition from, from Louisa, but generally in the market, are, the, are there similar concerns about envi- the environment and other eth- ethical issues? I think so. I mean, this year has given us all a lot more time to kind of sit and think and ponder things, which I know sounds a bit of a cliche, but I definitely think that it's made people... Um, reconsider ethical issues that they may have I mean if we think of busy, busyness as a sort of great anaesthetic for things normally we would have spent our year jumping on and off planes and going and visiting events and things and it's very very easy to kind of kick these large issues to the side and think we'll worry about that at some point and we've been forced to sit with things a lot more this year so I think that definitely has um, made people address larger ethical issues um, because they've got the time to do it as well some of these galleries have redeployed um, workforces that would normally be um, organizing you know the huge logistics of traveling to international fairs have actually kind of put them to the side and and some of them may be looking at issues such as um, how how green the gallery is as well. So I think they have been. One point about, you were talking about funding, um, being very mercenary, I think, with the museums, the money's got to come from somewhere for them to survive. And I think that a lot of, you know, big money often has some shade in terms of, of where it has come from or how those how these people have, have earned that money or built it. Um obviously to varying degrees um, a shade but one thing I think we will see more of we've already seen it rising is um, commercial gallery involvement with institutions as well and I think that's something that will probably come through next year that while a lot of the middle market galleries are struggling and smaller galleries are going to struggle to survive the bigger ones will probably be okay um, and it's obviously in their interest to have some of their artists um, or the estates that they represent in big institutional shows and I do think we might see more of those coming up over the next few years um, as we see more and more galleries and underneath the sort of sponsors lists and things. Um, so, yeah, so I think we'll see that. Um, uh, but as you say, I think that the climate issue with the Gallery Coalition um, is going to become something that, that people are going to really think about with regards to what fairs they return to and how they return to doing business too. And I think it should do. Another thing has been cancel culture as well, I suppose, which has um, been another issue that's come up. There's been the growth this year of, um, say, the Instagram account cancel art galleries too. Um, I think there's been increased scrutiny this year in terms of the conduct of um, gallery employees and gallery owners as well, rightly or or wrongly, in very public forums. So I'd say that that's also been a, a very kind of dominant theme certainly to the second half of this year as well. We'll be back with Anna, Louisa and Gareth in a moment, but first, here are some of the top stories on the Art Newspaper's website this week. Public museums and galleries in various parts of the world are closing again due to the pandemic. London's museums and galleries closed their doors on the 16th of December as the capital moved into the highest tier of Covid restrictions, or Tier 3. In the US, museums in Boston, Philadelphia and Milwaukee closed. Those in Washington DC had already closed their doors and those on the West Coast have been closed since March. In India, despite widespread opposition, the Prime Minister Narendra Modi has begun an overhaul of Delhi's grand complex of government buildings in a bid to sever the nation from its colonial past. As Kabir Jalal writes, at a ceremony held last week, Modi laid the foundation stone for a new building to replace Parliament House, designed by English architects Edward Lutyens and Herbert Baker, which upon its completion in 1927 became the seat of power for British-ruled India. The new building is scheduled to open in 2022, the 75th anniversary of India's independence. And finally, the identity of a nobleman depicted in an 18th century Indian miniature painting at the Colby College Museum of Art in Waterville, Maine, was recently uncovered by a first-year student at the college and corroborated by another graduating next spring, 
Boris Ludell writes. Previously known only as Man with a Flowered Coat, the sartorially stunning subject, holding a scroll and writing implement, has been identified as Sayyid Muzaffar, the commander-in-chief for the 17th century Sultan Abul Hassan. The student's discovery now links the miniature painting, held by the University Museum since 1959, to other portraits of Muzaffar hanging in the British Museum in London and the Rijks Museum in Amsterdam. You can read these stories and more at theartnewspaper.com or on our app for iOS, which you can get from the App Store. We'll be back after this. The Week in Art is sponsored by Christie's. As 2020 draws to a close, Christie's presents an updated schedule of auctions for the new year, beginning with Apta Frederick's 75 Years of Important English Furniture. Presented as a live auction in London on the 19th of January, the sale is an 140 lot celebration of the London-based English furniture dealers Apta Fredericks, who are internationally renowned for the superlative quality, condition and provenance of their pieces. Explore furniture and works of art from the likes of Spencer House, Langley Park and Clifton, made by the foremost craftsmen and designers of the 18th and 19th centuries. The refreshed schedule complements Christie's private sales. Bid and buy art at any time and from anywhere. Find out more on christies.com. Welcome back. Before we go on, do make sure you catch up with a new series of our other podcast, A Brush With, in which I have in-depth conversations with artists about their influences and cultural experiences. The first three episodes of this second series, with Ragnar Kjartansson, Christina Qualls and Ronnie Horn, are out now. And next week's episode is A Brush With Rachel Whiteread, the first ever guest on this podcast. Subscribe at Apple Podcasts, Spotify or wherever you're currently listening. Now back to our review of the year with Anna Brady, Louisa Buck and Gareth Harris. Let's talk about this then because it's it's crucial right across the art world. In the wake of the appalling murder of George Floyd, there was a reckoning amongst museums and galleries. We saw a an avalanche, frankly, of statements by museums, by commercial galleries right across the board about how they were going to take their responsibilities more seriously in with regard to equity, diversity, etc. It feel it felt to me like the first industry wide recognition of power structures being completely awry. Louisa? Well, I think also it was an industry-wide recognition, but I mean, the industry is notoriously white. It's notoriously privileged. And I think there was also a backlash against lots of institutions just making lots of kind of lip service, knee-jerk responses, saying how they stood behind, you know, Black Lives Matter. There was the the day when all the images on Instagram went black. And then there was a backlash saying, yes, but this is is tokenistic. And I'm thinking of, of the Guggenheim particularly, you know, where there was a, a, an absolute demand that they really rethink their their exhibition history, their, their treatment of, of the, the curator, Chaudre Le Bouvier, of the Jean-Michel Basquiat show. It's resulted in Nancy Spector, the chief curator, has left. I mean, it's not been officially linked but they've been you know people they've been definitely heads have been rolling and i think across across our institutions there's been a there's a genuine now you know feeling that there has to be greater inclusion there has to be a sense of of, of, of dealing with this but of course it's got to be you know right across across the board it's it's going to be very difficult just to do in a minute because you're talking about systemic change and in, in in the netherlands the musea beken and Koo, museum see color network i'm the right Museum, the Van Abbey Museum, the Stedelijk, a whole network of museums who've actually realised that they've got to they've got to join together and actually make a difference in their programmes, their audiences, their staffs, their partnerships, you know. So it's a really profound change that's got to take place. And I think our institutions are now realising. I'd like to see a similar kind of network in the UK, in fact. You know, they join together for the environment, but they haven't done so yet um, in, in institutions um, for, for this kind of I- inclusivity. And it's got to be really a profound change. But, the, but I definitely do think that, you know, the tragic death of, of, of George Floyd and, and then the whole sense of Black Lives Matter, which, of course, was founded in 2013. It didn't just kick off this summer, but it has gained a new momentum and a new importance. I mean, the toppling of the sculpture, the sculpture in Bristol, the, the Edward Coulson sculpture, again, you know, showing that every sort of aspect of the fabric of our of our society has got to now be scrutinised. The whole blackout square thing in June on Instagram drove me insane. I mean, I just thought that was pure tokenism, you know. And what came across then is that there was no clear overarching agenda in the art world about how to deal with 
with racism or on, on all the you know corresponding issues. I mean, it is a deeper existential reckoning for the art world. We know that, but you know, I spoke to this independent curator called Marianne Yemsi, and she said she seeing these posts is as violent as seeing all all these mentions of we stand in solidarity. She was quite angry about it all, actually. So in terms of what happens next, will be interesting. I mean, I don't. I thought the actual the the Guggenheim plan was very impressive. I think they. They were stung, weren't they, they, by a letter from current and former staff members um, alleging discriminatory practices. So in fairness, they did unveil quite a detailed plan in August to diversify their staff. So I thought that was quite a good move. But I I mean, I'm, I'm not sure anything has really progressed in a significant way on this front. I mean, I do think when things like Colston happened, the statue toppling in Bristol, there were some incredible reactions. We ran an op-ed by Thomas Price, and he was so eloquent about, you know, racism runs far deeper than representation. And this was all in response to Mark Quinn positing his, his statue of Jen Reed on the plinth. So I suppose, you know, there have been some fantastic reactions, but to my mind, there still isn't this clear overarching agenda about how we move forward. And of course, this branches off into all sorts of other issues like the Philip Guston censorship issue and that kind of thing. It also branches off into, you know, basic education. And it, these are broader socio-economic issues. And I think what's been interesting about this, this whole terrible, weird, challenging year that we've been in is it's thrown up just so many inequalities on a deep, profound level within society. And obviously we're talking about it through the prism of the art world. But, you know, the systemic racism, the systemic inequality and COVID has really thrown up these things as and the environmental in inequalities, all these injustices. And I think, you know, it has to be dealt with in a, in a profound, in a profound way from an educational system, an educational point of view, a socio-economic point of view. But the art world has to be seen to be making these systemic changes as well on all levels, I think. One of the key aspects of this discussion around equity and diversity has been about collections, of course. And so, yes, we're talking about more diverse staff in arts organisations, but also there needs to be a decolonisation, to use the modish term, of collections. Gareth, you've focused on this a fair amount, haven't you? And and, and do you feel there's a new impetus to the decolonisation of collections? Are museum directors facing up to it in the way that they perhaps should be, given the current climate? Um, I think there have been some very encouraging signs. I mean, France has led the way. Um, three years ago or so, President Emmanuel Macron made a landmark speech. And he, when he committed to, as he said, the temporary or definitive restitution of African heritage to Africa. So that heralded a huge sea change in how museums approach restitution or decolonisation, whatever we want to call it. So that has moved along fairly rapidly in the past few months. I think on 4th of November, French senators approved a bill to return 27 colonial era objects uh, to collections in Benin and Senegal. There have been some quite radical actions this year as well. There's been a Congolese activist called Emery Mwazulu Diabanza, and he's really been a real firebrand in Paris. He was given a thousand euro fine for attempting to seize a funeral pole from the Musée du Quai Bonly earlier this year. And he's one of the most vocal activists out there. But I, I'm i not sure. I mean, there, there have been sort of promising signs from various directors here. I think the British Museum have indicated they're going to enter some sort of arrangement with the new museum designed by David Adjaye, which I think is going to be in Ghana. So I think things are moving slowly. But again, perhaps we could argue that COVID has halted all sorts of issues like this. I'm not sure... It's interesting, France is leading, but I think this final hurdle might be much more difficult. I'm not sure how much of a priority it's going to be post-Covid. We're talking in the week that the Humboldt Forum in, in Berlin would have opened. And that in itself is indicative of how far European institutions have got to come on this. Because, you know, the Humboldt Forum in its very name, you know, it's Alexander Humboldt was an explorer, a sort of colonial explorer. And... That institution is deeply problematic. I mean, if you go on to their ethnological <laughs> section on the website, the first thing it mentions is that people can see reliefs from Benin. It seems that the claims for restitution for the Benin bronzes are falling on deaf ears in certain quarters. So it seems to me that we've got 
a long way to go in terms of decolonizing our museums and certainly in terms of the British response at the British Museum there's there's noises being made in this direction but there's you know there's this legal obstacle etc so it doesn't feel like people are really committing to a to a serious discussion about restituting objects I agree. I mean, there are plenty of noises being made. You're right. I mean, the British Museum talks about loan sharing, that kind of thing, collection sharing. Whether it'll opt for plain old restitution, as we say, that, you know, that's not going to happen, is it? As you say, there's legal issues around the whole thing. So I don't know how this is going to work, but it's a bit of a dance at the moment. I mean, perhaps we should shout out to Dan Hicks as well. You know, he's really championed the cause in his book, Friend of the podcast. Friend of the podcast in, in his recent publication, The Brutish Museums, which is one of the most detailed and well-researched accounts of how the kingdom of Benin was plundered. And it's well worth a read. I mean, it's quite complex in parts. I don't know how you found it, Ben. Did you have a quick glance? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, it, you know, it's, there's the, you know it's, it's within the context of critical theory, etc. But it's definitely one of the books of the year, mm. isn't it? I mean, it's, it's, it's really setting out the case, I think, very persuasively for returning these objects and kicking off conversations across Europe, uh, across these former totally. colonial nations, about the deeply problematic holdings in many of its encyclopedic museums and the very concept of encyclopedic museums in themselves. So read it, everyone. It's, it's, a, it's a great read. Yeah, he's caused a stir. Yeah, He has caused a stir. Um, let's talk about statues. You, you mentioned earlier on Edward Colston, Louisa. If, if you were to say to me what sums up 2020 in terms of one image from from in terms of arts and heritage that's it isn't it the toppling of the Edward Colston statue in Bristol such an iconic image and such an iconic moment he was not just toppled he was then flung into the into the quayside into the dock from whence the slavery ships would have set off and indeed arrived you know so it was a really iconic moment and the fact that this has been going on for decades this 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 sculpt the statue had been had been under under scrutiny so and 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 objected to and nobody had made any changes and it was it was a defining moment and then of course the artist um, Mark Quinn opportunistically putting a putting a statue of a Black Lives Matter protester with her consent in its place which was you know a completely sort of rankly opportunistic gesture by a white artist trying to kind of steal the debate but I think you know it just epitomised wider debates of the confederate sculptures across across the US and indeed um Throughout the UK, then, many sculptures came under scrutiny to the extent that the British culture minister, Oliver Dowden, said that institutions would get their funding cut if, if, mon- if monuments and, and, and statues were removed. You know, so there was this a whole debate about it. And you're right to point to the situation in the US because, in a way, that was the kind of... This, that was where this huge debate over statues has really gained such prominence, isn't it? Because of the Confederate statues. And it's, it's, it's notable that in the past, Trump has referred to them as beautiful statues. And, 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 you know, even the fact that, you know, that they are deeply racist and emerge from racist eras, you know. But it's the fact that that has not just snowballed. It's not just the Confederate statues now. There are statues of Columbus that are rightly being questioned, in my view. It's, it, you know, the whole visual fabric of history in the United States is being questioned and it seems to me that this is going to keep rumbling on even though there is now a democratic president who preaches a kind of um, less divided nation it seems to me that the, the, the debate about statues of Columbus and confederate soldiers is not going to go away and it's just going to keep rumbling on I don't know about what you think what you think Gareth yeah I I think the issue of revising history is most fraught in relation to the issue of historical statues in the US. It doesn't mean we're exempt from it here, you know. And I I just want to come back to the Dowden point that Louisa raised, the fact that Oliver Dowden wrote to arm's length bodies threatening to to cut funding. I mean, I just want to say that even the Museums Association, the advocacy group in the UK for museums, stepped in and said, we feel this contravenes the long-established principle that national museums and other bodies operate at arm's length from government, you know. I think it was just incredible that they felt the need to say that. And, you know, it's the most political act going, really, in terms of... I I mean, I was staggered, to be honest. But back to the US, I do think, yeah, that whether racist sculpture should still stand, if we want to call them that, will will resonate way beyond Joe Biden coming to the White House in January. I just don't see how this issue is going to end, really. No, but it seems it seems likely, at least that under Biden-Harris, we're going to see 
the President's Committee on the Arts and Humanities Reform. They they resigned en masse about the statues issue, actually. They, when there were those appalling events in Charlottesville, that, that committee resigned en masse at the, the, the both sidesism that Trump adopted in relation to, to white supremacists marching through that, that, that city. Um, so it seems, you know, it's very difficult to predict what the future of the arts in the US will be under Biden. But it seems at least that there will be a consideration of the arts. Both Biden and and uh, Kamala Harris seem at least to be pro the arts. Well, it sent out the most fantastic message to me that their, their celebration film and their celebration video was inspired by Lorraine Grady's wonderful 1983 performance, Art Is, putting the gold frames around the faces of people. And more significantly, that the celebration video inspired by Lorraine Grady was done with Lorraine Grady's consent. They didn't just nick her idea they actually went to the artist and asked her if they could use that and I think you know it's very encouraging I mean both Biden and Kamala Harris have been involved in capital projects with museums in Washington there's a general sense that you know a bit of a reboot back to normal you know with Trump blowing up heritage sites to make wall, you know to make his horrible wall sites his desire to make federal buildings beautiful again you know all the terrible appalling things that he did I mean across the board but culturally as well I think now we can have a bit of you know a sense of of somebody in the White House um, with a, with a, with a realization of the fact that culture is crucial to our well being. There's going to be a sea change across all you know in all sorts of areas. I think we we ran a great piece on the art newspaper website, written by our New York office that included artists' reactions to Biden's election. I was really struck by comments from Mexican artist Pedro Reyes about gun control. And he said that Joe Biden has fought twice on one against the NRA. National Rifle Association, yeah, yeah. And he says we will see more and better gun sense policy coming now from the White House. I just thought it was a really interesting statement about something that's, you know, dominates American society. And he's made works about guns in Mexico, so he knows about guns. Yeah, that's great. I wanted to talk about two aspects of America that that have been prominent this year and have been connected to the whole Black Lives Matter thing. The first thing is the deaccessioning debate and that the sort of lightning rod for the, for the deaccessioning debate was the Baltimore Museum of Art. So basically what happened is that the AAMD which is this mu- museum directors board for art museums essentially l- l- made the rules around deaccessioning a bit less strict during the COVID period so that people could deaccession to raise funds for something other than artworks. And the Baltimore Museum took advantage of this to to put up for auction works by Andy Warhol, Clifford Steele and Bryce Marden. Now, these were major works in their collection and Anna, it sort of backfired on them, didn't it? Yeah, well, they withdrew them at the 11th hour from an auction. They were going to be the headline lots of this Sotheby's sale Um, and they just bowed to pressure. Interestingly, I think it was only the week beforehand that the director came on the podcast, didn't he, to to, um, defend the decision to sell them off. It's a difficult thing because with the deaccessioning, these were the most valuable, some of the most valuable works in their collection um, and some of the most important, perhaps, depending on your definition of, of what's going to be important. So hence, they were going to be the ones that were chosen to be sold off and you know, Bryce Marden particularly still being alive, it's um, quite a sort of, you know, maybe a bit of a snub to him as well if a, if a museum is selling off your art, although luckily he's pretty well established. Um, it, I don't know, it's, the whole deaccessioning thing is a, is a difficult one to me. Obviously it depends on where the funds are going in terms of um, maintaining the collection or whether they're going to start paying the salaries of staff. Um, which which shouldn't happen, but I, but I can see that that museums are stuck in a sort of catch twenty two with uh, with this. They need the money desperately, um, and making this value judgment on how important the works of art are, or, or who how or which should be sold off, it's not a position that I would want to be in. But I think the, you know, it, it is very much on a case-by-case basis, and you're quite right, Anna, it depends on what the works are going to be used for. I mean, if they're going to be used to perhaps increase the holdings in a certain artist, I mean, I'm thinking of the Tate, who sold off um, Juan Munoz's staircase, um, an interest, very interesting work, but they, they sold it off to buy 
another work to, to deepen their to deepen their holdings in that particular artist or indeed the Brooklyn Museum I think I'm right in saying sold off Corot, Corbet, Monet, Miro but carefully researched where they lay within the collection and what they were going to be used for again to put back into the collection not to fix a hole in the roof or to pay the staff more I think it's it's problematic when you know you use it as an alternative form of funding and often perhaps to, to, to hide mismanagement of, of funds to quickly sell off the silver to, to stop a gap no, I, I mean, I just want to say, I thought Christopher Bedford, the director of the Baltimore Museum, he's argued, hasn't he, that around, well, he hoped that around $54.5 million would go towards a new endowment for the future, as he called it, which would go to towards the direct care of the collection. I think he did argue it would bolster the salaries of staff members. So, I mean, it's, I, I agree with Louise, it's got, surely it's got to be case by case, you know, don't you think? But I sort of thought, he came on and I sort of thought he made quite a persuasive case that the audience for the Baltimore Museum of Art that they want to attract is overwhelmingly African-American and that he, that he wanted to create a museum that was more friendly to them. And that, that seems to me to be a, a noble aim. And, you know, they've already sold lots of works from their collection to buy more works by African-American and more diasporic artists. And I think... One of the key things about this is there is a sort of culture war in the museum community. You know, there are there there is there are the people that, that like to adhere to the old principles and there are those people who spot the systemic problems and are trying to do something about it and in, you know one of the arguments here is that Christopher Bedford went far too far but I, I'm you know when he came onto the podcast I have to say even though I love Clifford Steele even though I love Bryce Marden I kind of was persuaded by his argument but isn't he rewriting art history then in that Way. Well, uh, are we? This is the thing. Are we not? Are we not saying that there are alternative histories? Yeah. Louis? I would have thought there'd been other ways of doing it. I think if I'm right in saying the Clifford Still was actually given by Clifford Still to the museum, you know, it was quite a hot potato. I mean, I totally agree in the principle of actually making your making your collection more diverse. But I also agree with the principle of, of working with the collection that you've got and then inviting other artists to respond to it and react to it, to augment it, to show there are many different art histories, but to actually not have a sort of a across the board, you know, have the quirks in the museum's collection, obviously if it hasn't come from some totally hideous blood-stained past, um, but, but you know, and then and then engage with it. And, and there could have been other ways, I think, of raising that money, or it's a very much a case-by-case -case minutiae thing, but I think a, a, an overall theme of flogging off the collection to kind of help running costs or to help, you know, those kind of aspects is, is problematic. But on the other hand, I think, you know, keeping this sort of completely preserved and Aspect, aspect of your collection is problematic as well. So there has to be a sensibility. But I think, you know, by and large, museum directors want to make their museums, you know, hopefully do the best they can for their communities. And if they don't, they should be replaced by people who do. Indeed. Let's talk about this other issue that I wanted to talk about in America then, which is the Philip Guston exhibition. We've covered this huge amount on, on, on this podcast, uh, on our website. It was a massive issue. Four museums postponed an exhibition that was planned to open this year. It ended up being postponed because of COVID and then po postponed for much longer because the museums decided that they needed a more adequate response to the content of Guston's works, particularly these works which feature um, KKK uh, hooded figures, and they felt that they needed to postpone it so that in the wake of Black Lives Matter they could respond to it more adequately. And boy, was there a furore, Louisa. Well, yes, I mean, across the board, commentators came out, Guston's daughter, saying that, you know, the idea, and I'm quoting what the statement said, it said, it was going to be postponed until a time we think that the powerful message of social and racial justice is, is, is at the centre of Philip Guston's work can be more clearly interpreted. Well, I mean, the curators had absolutely done that. I mean, the catalogue was it's called, it's called Guston Now, and it meant now, and the catalogue had included some really punchy essays by a whole collection of artists, including two African-American artists, Trenton Doyle Hancock and Glenn Ligon, who made persuasive entreaties as to how important those Ku Klux Klan paintings had actually been to them to discuss power, to discuss white, white power. Guston's whole conflicted attitude towards this. Guston was evidently utterly, utterly anti-racist throughout. And, and so, of 
course, what happened then was 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 the curators, um, one of the curators, Mark Godfrey, then actually came out and protested at length on Instagram against the decision, saying that it was patronising to viewers to expect that you know they were not sophisticated enough to be able to interpret in their own right, and also to say that it was actually doing Guston the most terrible disservice and throwing him under the bus in a way. And so you know he he has now been suspended by the Tate, and and you know there's there's been a whole furore about it, and I think it was a really poor judgment by the museums because it was the very time that these issues, yes, Guston's a white male artist, but a white male artist making such important points about the conflicted, problematic times in which we live. And these KKK images were appallingly, you know, evocative and brave and and so important that we actually deal with this with these issues which are so alive and so living as the death of George Floyd has, has amply and tragically demonstrated. Gareth, did you want to say something? I think the most powerful testimonies came from those artists, Trent and Doyle Hancock, in the catalogue, saying Guston made the case that the Klan was as American as apple pie. I just think, you know, you can't be more eloquent, really. He didn't run... Guston, f- Guston was <laughs> saying, am I a white supremacist? And, and, you know, to say for a white person to, in America today to say, am I a white supremacist just by nature of being white and part of this power system? It, it, what more eloquent images are there of white supremacy, which is such a dominant force in America right now than these? I mean, yeah, I mean, we should point out as well that Kay Wynne Feldman, the director of the National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C., she did she did come out fighting actually and she said she wasn't convinced the show could be done without having an African American curator <clears throat> as part of the project. So, I mean, she did she did try to defend that decision. I'm not sure we were all convinced by that because most of the art world pointed out that Guston's intention was to critique racism <laughs> in other words, you know, that that's the main point. But we know that they've brought the show forward, haven't they? It's not going to be 2024 now. It's going to be earlier. So, yes, it was going to be postponed by four years and it will now be postponed by two years. So a bit of a win for the protests, in other words. But will it will it then have the Ku Klux Klan paintings in it? I mean, what will how will it be reconfigured? I think it's really problematic doing this kind of post facto reshaping of, of an exhibition that was already addressing all these issues in its first instance. We've kind of talked about a hell of a lot of really, really troubling and difficult things <laughs> so far in this podcast. So we're going to end by focusing on our works of the year. As you know, if you listen to the podcast regularly, we have our works of the week. And all four of us are going to choose a work of the year in this podcast. I'll begin with you, Louisa. What would you like to choose? Well, it's been very difficult. It was a surprisingly, given the fact we were behind closed doors for so much of this year, there was a surprisingly large amount of works to choose from. I'm thinking of the stunning self-portraits by the non-binary South African artist activist Zanelli Moholi at Tate Modern, or the gory baroque brilliance of Artemisia Gentileschi in the National Gallery, or indeed the many public works. Jeremy Della, Thank God for Immigrants, this great poster that was put in everyone's windows and on billboards. Or indeed, very recently, Steve McQueen's glorious film Lover's Rock, which charged a whole evening of a, of, a, of a house party in 1980 in Labrook Grove. It's part of his five great films about revisiting black British history, putting it on the BBC, four, five feature-length films, or indeed the, the strange dark canvas that was at the finale of Lynette Yardin Boake's magnificent twice-postponed show at Tate Britain, which is called The Stygian Silk, which is a man reclining with a pack of black dogs around him. But all those to one side, I actually decided to plump for Derek Jarman's garden at Prospect Cottage in Dungeness. Now, this is a place that I visited on New Year's Day 2020. It's this, I'm little knowing what was going to be happening in in the future. It's this miraculous garden in the shingle, the most bleak outlook on Dungeness Beach with a huge nuclear power station looming above it. Um, Derek Jarman actually bought the cottage um, in 1986 and discovered that he was HIV positive and decided to create a garden out of this shingle, which he did magnificently um, until his his death in 1994. 
coaxing out not just the local amazing plants, but also putting earth under the stones and making roses grow, foxgloves grow, but also local sea holly, poppies. It was a beautiful place. And and, and this, this garden was then recreated. So the first in, in the Garden Museum um, in London, and one of the first shows devoted, it was devoted to Derek Jarman in his garden, one of the first shows after lockdown that I rushed to when it opened um, in July was to this exhibition to see images of Derek Jarman in these beautiful films um, actually in this garden. Part of the garden was actually the shingle was brought in into this museum so you could walk across the shingle. Part of Derek Jarman's prospect cottage was recreated with his gardening implements inside it. Also his paintings, these black tarry paintings railing against AIDS, his AIDS diagnosis and, and the fact that the prejudice had existed then. Um, and then his joyful landscape of the 90s, their environmental paintings as well. So Jarman's garden throughout of a past pandemic seemed to speak so much of this pandemic and this situation. His films are all about gender fluidity, inclusivity, and it's it's a marvellous you know testament to him. And also within lockdown, one of the first weeks of lockdown, um, the Prospect Cottage was saved for the nation by, by an appeal. So £3.5 million was raised in 10 weeks to save Prospect Cottage. So this garden has punctuated my year from New Year's Day to the to during lockdown when the garden was saved to this inspirational recreation in the Garden Museum after lockdown and I fully intend to go back again at the beginning of 2021 to think of this garden that gives us all hope against all odds. How lovely. Gareth, your choice for the year. I think it's worth reflecting on Cara Walker's monumental fountain, Fons Americanus, which is still standing in Tate Modern's Turbine Hall. I do think that in light of Black Lives Matter and the death of George Floyd, Walker's subversive take on British colonialism and imperialism, that resonates all the more now. I think it's fascinating and the kind of how she even looked at the erasure of black history in British monuments. It's fascinating, in, you know, in, in the light of the events this year. And very quickly, uh, when I went to see the Masculinity Show at the Barbican Centre in London earlier this year, something that really stayed with me were Thomas Dworzak's photos of the Taliban fighters in Afghanistan. And he discovered them in the back room of a work in Photoshop in Kandahar. And these were passport photos taken of Taliban militants and they are, some of them are covered, they have flowers in their hair, they have that cold mascara, they're wearing this kind of ancient mascara. I think that's an absolutely fascinating insight into, into how the Taliban operated behind closed doors. And the very last mention is, it's worth going to see Lydia Blakely's paintings, which are bold, beautiful and very British at Nehru Ratnam Gallery in London. Thank you. Anna? Um we're being really, really bad at choosing individual works. <laughs> <laughs> you are. I'm, it's very naughty like, of all three of you. It's like for my one wish, I'm going to wish for three wishes. Um, I also thought that Cara Walker's Fonz Americanus is fantastic and remarkably prescient. And it's sort of extraordinary to think it went up last October as well, because it feels like a work that is so fitting for this year. And it's sort of it feels like it's living on borrowed time as well now and that it was meant to have disappeared and it was still there sort of post lockdown when when Tate reopened and I really hope it hasn't been destroyed yet right it's still there I, I think, think as far as we know it's still yeah. there it's still up, because there's talk that it's been that it's going to be destroyed and while whilst I completely understand that from a sustainability point of view I really, really hope that they don't in this case. Um, I think it's going to be recycled. Yeah, it's going to it's, it's going, going to be, be recycled, recycled, not 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 totally destroyed. Although, if there are any collectors listening to this that have massive gardens, <laughs> apparently it could exist outside. So buy the thing. But perhaps it Keep needs. It intact, I think it needs please. to be recast. Probably doesn't it? That's so it's, not in cork. it's made of core. Mm. Yeah. Yes, it's made I of cork. It could get quite swollen. Yes. <laughs> Otherwise, I would definitely be offering a home to it. Um, but uh, so I thought that was fantastic. It's quite controversial. I don't know that I love the work particularly, but I think just for having captured the public imagination this year, the mysterious monolith that's appeared in the Utah desert and then Romania, apparently. Um, which some people are saying is by John McCracken, um, which David Zwerner, his gallerist, seems to be perpetuating that myth um, somewhat. I think that's kind of a fantastic thing that uh, whilst we're all trapped at home, this thing that seems to have been beamed into the desert is, is really catching people's imagination. But I do wish that people wouldn't 
go and fly to the middle of the desert or drive there and leave their toilet paper there to go and to go and see it. But I think that's been kind of one of those um, fantastic stories and really what art should be about too. Great. And I'm going to choose one work, unlike the rest of you. Um, it's from my show of the year and one of the shows of I most look forward to in my life, I think, which was the Titian Love Desire Death at the National Gallery. Again, sadly, not seen by as many people who should have seen it remarkable exhibition of just seven paintings actually the six poesia which Titian painted for Philip II of Spain in the 1540s and 50s um, a remarkable series of mythological paintings reunited for the first time in more than 400 years and the work that I've chosen to focus on is the Rape of Europa which is emblematic of so much that was great about Titian. Firstly, his incredible painting, this um, Matthias Wivel, the curator, came on and he talked about how um, Titian almost had this synesthetic sense, this ability to recreate atmosphere that was unsurpassed among painters. Um, his ability to, of course, to depict flesh and particularly female flesh. Uh, his storytelling, his, his brilliant ability to evoke this myth, Jupiter turning himself into uh, a bull and and abducting this noble woman Europa and that's the moment that that uh, Titian captures and you know you have the these extraordinary fish around him this, the, the mountainous landscape and everything else but also National Gallery doesn't do contemporary politics much but it did sort of creep in a bit because of course what we were looking at there was a profound image of male power the most powerful artist in Europe at the time commissioned by the most powerful man in the world at that time Philip II and producing an image of male violence against women and so I, I like the fact that the national seemed to be engaging with contemporary debates about it and and obviously an extraordinary image but actually of course a very deeply troubling one and it's stayed with me all year and I believe it will continue until January that show so if the National Gallery does reopen in time go and see it if you can and if you're in London. Thank you all three of you uh, Anna, Louisa and Gareth thank you so much for joining us it's, we've got through quite a lot there. <laughs> Thank you. Happy Christmas. Happy yeah. Christmas. Thank you, Ben. Happy Christmas. You can read various articles looking back over 2020 on the website or the app. And that's it for this episode, and indeed for this year. You can subscribe to The Art Newspaper at theartnewspaper.com, click on the subscribe link at the top left of the page, and you'll find a range of subscriptions. And do subscribe to this podcast and a brush with if you haven't already done so, and please give us a rating or review if you've enjoyed it. You can also find us on Twitter at Tan Audio and on Facebook and Instagram, of course. The Week in Art is produced by Julian Michalska, Amy Dawson and David Clack, and David also does the editing and sound design. Thanks to Anna, Louisa and Gareth. And a big thank you to Margaret Carrigan. You may notice that Margaret hasn't been on the pod for a couple of weeks, and that's because she has, sadly, left the art newspaper for Pastures New. Thank you, Maggie, for all your wonderful contributions. We hope to have you back in your new incarnation as a freelance writer. And to all our listeners, thank you for joining us. We'll see you next year, and we're back on the 15th of January. Happy holidays, and bye for now. The Week in Art is sponsored by Christie's. Visit christies.com to find out more about the world's leading auction house since 1766. Auction, private sales, online, art, anytime.